All right, everyone. Well, we are going to get started. We are right at 7.01. And I think it's a good time for us to just go ahead and get started. Jeannie is my co-pilot. She's going to monitor the chat. Jeannie, if you can just wave for us really, really quickly. All right, so let me share my screen. Okay, so tonight we are here to discuss chapter two of our book, Thinking Reading, What Every Secondary Teacher Needs to Know About Reading. So we are on chapter two, Misconceptions About Reading and Their Consequences. We had Steve start us off last week with chapter one, so hopefully you all were able to join um, Steve, facilitate that session. If you were not able to join, that's quite all right. You didn't miss much of anything, but we do have um, that recording on our YouTube channel and we can share that recording or the YouTube channel with you guys after um, towards the end of this uh, session today. So chapter two, misconceptions about reading and their consequences. So I'm going to present this slideshow, and I just want to ask you all this quick question. How many of you all know that it's never too late? It's never too late. So just think about that for a moment, because misconception number one, the common misconception that they introduced in chapter two, that one really resonated with me um, right away which was if students haven't learned to read by the time they reach secondary school, it is too late. And I'm just going to admit something to you all um, because right now we're, we're pretty close friends right now. So I'm just going to admit something. So in 2010, I was charged to teach seventh grade students. And this was a self-contained classroom. And we were work, and I was working with seventh graders the entire day. I might have my assistant that would come in that would teach history or social studies, um, but pretty much I taught the entire day. And my background is working with the littles, elementary age students. So I knew that I had, I knew that I had a, a I knew that my school year, or I thought my school year was going to be very challenging. So when I got to seventh grade, started teaching, and I was introduced to my students, I did not know that I was going to be introduced to seventh graders that were not able to read at grade level. Because I was used to working with first graders, second graders, and I'm teaching them how to read kindergarten, first and second, and that's my background with teaching younger students. But now I'm working with seventh grade students. And I said, okay, I have over seven students that are not reading at grade level. What am I going to do? Is it too late for the kiddos? But I had to realize there was something that I had to do just a little bit differently. And if I did not have my background with working with the littles and teaching reading, I probably would have just given up. We started off in chapter two with a very similar story that I've heard with colleagues and even just saying that students are not going to be able to read and having that fixed mindset instead of that growth mindset. So this came, if I had read this book in 2010, I would have said, okay, yeah, it is too late. But now knowing after working with my group of seventh graders in 2010, it's never too late. So as you read this quote, you've probably seen this plenty of times from Emily Hanford. You've probably seen it or you've heard it. But as numerous studies have shown, reading is different. Our brains don't know how to do it. To be able to read, we have to be taught to read. So I knew that my instruction and my knowledge had to change and my mindset had to change in order for my students to be able to read. And I couldn't point the blame on others and say, well, they didn't learn how to read from then when they were in elementary school. So why is it my job as a secondary teacher or as a middle school teacher? So I know most of you shared, well, before we got started, your name and where you're from. If you didn't get a chance to do any of that, please do that now and share with us. If you are in education, what grade you're teaching. If you're not in education, feel free to just tell us what you're doing now, just so I can get a range of my audience. So my name is Jeanette Russell. 
I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin with my husband and my three daughters. We live in Wauwatosa, which is right outside of Milwaukee. I have been a teacher for probably 15 years. I've taught just about every grade level from pre-kindergarten all the way to ninth grade English. Um, currently, I'm not teaching in the classroom anymore, but I do work for a tech company called Lexia. So we work with school districts implementing our literacy programs like Letters for Five, Power Up. We have a new program called Lexia English. I also teach at UW-Whitewater, teaching pre-service teachers. Um, so there, the list goes on. So enough about me. If anyone wants to come off chat and just share a little bit about your experience with teaching, and we're going to get a little bit deeper into that as well. So anyone, feel free to come off chat at any time because this is such a small group. So just going to the chat just to see um, where everyone is from and make sure you take time to read and look at where everyone is from and what they do. So Laura, you're in Shorewood. I was just in Shorewood earlier today. Um, my kids are going to college for kids at UW uh, Milwaukee. So I've spent some time over there today um, and last week and this week. So I was just in, at the Shorewood Library. Okay. All right, so let's do this. Let's see, I want you all to take a look at these two questions. Which explanations for poor reading have you heard before? And remember in chapter two, the authors opened with that story about the teacher saying that this child has dyslexia, there's going to be no way that this student is ever going to be able to learn how to read. Let's talk about some of the conversations that you've heard before. So I'm just gonna pause for everyone to get their thoughts together if you want to come off mute and share with us and then feel free to share what you've heard in the chat. I'm good at pausing and waiting, so <laughs> I can give us some wait time. Or if you want to go straight to the next question that I have on here, are there any explanations on which you have changed your views as a result of reading this chapter? So you may not believe some of these misconceptions now, but before in the past, did they come about? Um, just like my story relating back to being a seventh grade teacher in 2010, when I did initially think that it was too late, I was thinking that, oh, middle school st students, they should all be reading at grade level, but I had no idea because my background was with uh, working with elementary age students. So I'm still pausing, giving us some wait time, waiting for someone to come off mute and share. I'll share. Um, so I teach high school. I have a ninth through 12th grade and I co-teach in a history class, English classes and a science class. And I often get, well, they can't read by ninth and 10th grade. They're never going to catch up um, because they are reading usually to seventh sometimes sixth grade reading level, but their peers are reading in the ninth, 10th grade reading level. And how are we ever gonna make that amount of progress in a year's time? Mm -hmm. um, something I hear a lot is just, well, they're special ed, they have a label. So you need to teach them how to do it. They don't belong in the regular ed room. Um, they're too far behind. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? What else have you heard?
Okay, what about the next question? Are there any explanations on which you have changed your views as a result of reading this chapter? So we're talking about you personally. What have, what view, what made you change your view? Have you changed your views as a result of reading this chapter? So I have for the first five misconceptions on this slide, just so you don't have to go ahead and dig through that chapter. So is there anyone on that on this list right here on this, this slide? That made you change the view after reading this chapter? I don't know if it was a change of view, but um, one of them that really like, and I had to keep reading over was that the lower reading achievement actually um, can lower their IQ um, so that if their IQ can change then, because I hear that a lot. Well, their IQ can't change. Well, if they're not being taught how to read properly, um, then their IQ definitely can change. And that kind of got reinforced in this chapter a couple different times for me. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a perfect example of how sometimes we do hear that your IQ can't change. Um, I mean, with that proper and adequate instruction that you may have been missed, that a student was missing in the past, and now that they do have some of those skills, they definitely would be able to, your IQ score will definitely increase. Anyone else for the first five that are on this slide? The overlay is kind of surprised me. Um, that was the first time I've ever kind of heard or read that the overlays really aren't scientifically based for some of those students. So just saying with this misconception, thinking about that students will always need support such as overlays or assistance given. But just thinking about when we are making sure that students are reading independently, they may not have all of those supports um, in different settings or different environments. The next five are on this slide, just so you don't have to dig through the chapter. Anything here stood out to you? The misconception about the motivating, um, interesting books will motivate them to read. I don't know, I think I have, a, I have a problem with that. I don't entirely agree with that because I've seen that like anecdotally that that is a gateway for students to be interested in more into reading and that they're more apt to at least try to read and sustain reading when it's something that they are, I don't know. I think there's a lot more research on when a student is interested in a topic that supports that choice and interest that does lead to motivation to read. I agree with you, Caitlin. I found that very hard to believe when I was reading that um, misconception. I was like, gosh, I think that's the only way sometimes I can get my middle schoolers and high schoolers um, to even attempt to pick up a book and read. Um, I had a hard time with that one too. <laughs> I mean, I have to agree with the both of you. I mean, I definitely think even with my middle, when I was teaching middle school, they definitely wanted to read something that was very interesting to them and it definitely motivated them and they wanted to see um, and listen to stories with characters that looked like them. They wanted to hear um, and read and see about what was very interesting to them. But I think the part that changes where it says, which will lead them to becoming more competent readers. Do we 
necessarily but that's the part so introducing students to interesting books will motivate them to read for sure it will definitely motivate them to read but will this be the only way for them to become more competent independent proficient readers i think that's the part that i'm getting to go ahead kelly and if they can't read from the bottom i mean if you think of, i'm thinking of scarborough's reading rope if you think of not meeting of the phonemic awareness the phonics and the fluency if they can't read, they can't read. And yeah, they're going to find stuff that's interesting. You think of the baseball study, that of course they're going to read if they're interested. But for high school, secondary, the majority of the stuff they have to read that they're not interested in. So I, unless I, we're- I, Yeah, I agree with you, Kelly, on that, where you're, I was just going to add on to that because yep. I think what the author is trying to say is by the time we get kids in secondary school, they are five to six grade levels behind. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. can't just- think that you give them a motivating, uh, interesting book, they're going to want to do something that is so difficult for them that yeah. they are. And we're talking about the kids that are the most struggling readers, not and, the kids that are no. kind of right there on the edge. We're talking like the ones that are in the bottom 25 percentile who by the time they're in middle school, they're just not interested in doing yeah. that anymore. And, and giving them interesting books, not going to turn yeah. their light on. But they're really good at making it look like they're reading right. and they're reading stuff. Right. But it's, right. it's crucial that if no matter what you give them, if they can't read, if you can't assess where their deficits are, mm -hmm. I don't care what you give them, they're, they're, they can't read. They can look like right. it and they're going to get through it, you know, so right. I guess that's been my biggest breakthrough in the last couple of years is they need that. They need those phonemic awareness and the phonics and the fluency and all that stuff before they can truly become um, strong readers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I one of the I, I think just motivation, they do need to be motivated, but just motivation is not gonna teach a child to read. And so, I mean, I think it is important to find books that they like, but, um, you know, I just think of, I mean, when we all believe all children are motivated to read, they all want to learn mm -hmm. to read. And so I think just having a book they like isn't gonna teach them to read if they're still right. struggling. Yeah, and I'm not motivated to read. I'm, I'm not motivated to do anything I'm not good at. So right. I don't yeah. care how, exactly. how I'm exactly. supposed to. If I'm not good at it, I'm not doing it. Yeah, and I if you think, unlock those doors, all of a sudden, their motivation increases because they're seeing some success. I also think that oh. middle school and upper school kids are so great at masking that they can't read, that this is why this is a misconception because people go, oh, but look at them. They're looking at the pages of the book and they're following along. So they think, mm -hmm. oh, we've done it without having done any of the hard work underneath there by just like magically giving them a book, here you go um, with that because they can mask and pretend that interest and they can listen to what other people are saying to be able to answer at least some of the questions. Yeah, and I, I'm just thinking of the most angry boys that I just worked with in the classroom. And there's no book in the world that's gonna motivate them to read. So, yeah. Oh, I do something you're not good at. Just let's 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 be a little jerk in class so I can pretend not to. Hundred percent. And the other yeah. one in the in digital age, reading is less important. I, I really disagree with that because when we think of text, text is not just books. It's visuals. It's it's political cartoons. It's graphs. It's all these things, and we have to be able to not only read them but also read them with the sense of mind of are they credible. I think it's even more important now in the technology to be able to read. Mm -hmm. I think this is a great conversation and a great start for what we are going to discuss in our breakout rooms because I really want everyone to get something out of this discussion. So for our breakout rooms, we have three new questions um, in which we somewhat got into um, just now. So I'm going to put the three questions in the chat. And when we go into the breakout rooms, you all will be able to have the questions available. One thing that you want to do is make sure you know to what everyone is talking about and choose someone that's going to be the speaker and share out with us what your group discussed. Um, so first question, which misconception resonates the most with you? How convinced were you by the reasoning and research that was offered in the text? Um, 
do you still believe that one or more of the explanations challenged in this chapter is valid and why? So we started to get into this piece, but I think we need to go a little bit deeper and I think we can do that in the breakout rooms. So I'm going to put the questions in the chat so you all will have them. So there they are, and then I'm going to stop sharing. And so I'm going to give us about, it's 721. We're going to come back together as a whole group. Let's say at seven, what do you think, Jeannie, 740? Let's come back at 740 and we'll share out and then we'll have some final thoughts and go from there. So we have, there are 16 of us. Let's do four breakout rooms. All right, everyone, I'll see you all in a second in about 20 minutes. All right, Jeannie, you, you didn't have to remind me. I remember to resume. So welcome back, everyone. Um, I was able to hop into a few rooms and we had some great conversations going. Um, Hopefully we are all ready to share. Um, let me share my screen and go back to presentation. So here we are. Okay, so let's start with breakout room number one. Um, someone from breakout room number one, come off mute and just share with us what your group discussed. Um, I think I represent breakout group number one. Um, the two main things we talked about is the power of AI and some of the exciting things it's doing, but also um, the challenge and potential like increasing of gaps. So like without having a teacher to help students navigate it, um, some of the things that can come up. And then the other thing we talked about is um, I spent a lot of time working like with Orton Gillingham and then moving into the public school system and being like already like with this like information and being like, oh, I'm so excited. Um, and then meeting my students, just the level of trauma and how trauma becomes like a major, it's it's just a it it just feels different in terms of navigating that space with a student and keeping them engaged and keeping them um, focused on what needs to happen and to learn to really, really read and comprehend and like catch up with their peers. Thank you for sharing that, Laura. Does anyone want to respond to Laura or add anyone from group number one or breakout room number one want to add? And I had the opportunity to hop into your room, um, Laura, and uh, when we talked about um, misconceptions that you thought should possibly be in this chapter, what did you think was a missing? Um, that's when you started to talk about trauma-informed um, care. And then Jeannie, I was telling them about Steve and how that's Steve's background. Um, and if they, if Steve was in this room right now, he would definitely go into um, more information and go into detail about that topic. So let's move on to- I, I just wanna add on, people wanna Google Steve Dykstra trauma, um, Google that, you'll find presentations that he's done on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was one podcast he did that was yeah. just incredible. Now, when he talked last year at the Reading League conference down in Milwaukee, huh, so good. So let's go ahead to room number two. Who wants to share out from breakout room two?
I, I don't know what breakout room I was in. <laughs> I don't know the number. It was Katie and Janice. You all were number two. Oh, okay, okay. Janice, do you wanna share the metaphor that you shared with me? Sure, I, I would be happy to. I'm, I'm sorry, I had um, turned the volume down. Um, when we were talking about the idea about motivation, I just want to back up just for one second to talk to you a little bit about the fact that I'm a psychologist, so I'm, I'm all about motivation. But this misconception was explained to me as I'm learning about reading as if I wanted to go to Italy and I really, really wanted to learn the Italian language and I rushed out and I got a book in Italian because I'm so excited about it and I would come home and I still would not be able to read the book because no one had taught me Italian yet. It's that same kind of issue for kids. If you got a book about race cars, because you're so very excited about race cars, but you can't read it, it's it's that same. And that, that was just um, one of the things that we had talked about. And I know with a group like this, just jumping in and <laughs> shouting out what I wanted to say was maybe easier in the breakout room. So thank you for helping me with that. No problem, Janice. Thank you for sharing that. That's a very important. And I would I had the pleasure of hopping into your room as well. And we were talking about student motivating students to read and giving them interesting texts. Would that teach them how to read? And Jeannie, you and I were talking and we were saying that you don't have to love reading. You do have to know how to read, but my students don't have to love it. You don't have to love reading. <laughs> I'm giving away time, Jeannie. I oh, you... I was just gonna. Sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm home. I'm home on my own with my three kids and making dinner. Um, so I'm like a little slow to the draw here. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I'm also, I'm coming at this from a secondary teacher perspective, uh, but also as a mom of two dyslexic children. So this is like very dear to my heart. And you know, one of my children, even as a third grader, no, second grader basically just gave up on reading he's like I'm just never gonna read and I'm just gonna move on with life and I'll do other things and I'll listen to audiobooks and I'm just never gonna read and that's just a second grader so you just imagine how ingrained that is by the time they're you know in middle school and high school but just just to remind myself of that little person he was and that they all were and that all kids absolutely do want to learn to read and like you said I if they love reading great if not, I know that they can pick up a book and read it, and maybe someday they will find the right book for them. But just that they can if they want. It's their power to use. Thank you for sharing that, Katie. Let's go on to room number three. I'm great at giving wait time. So room number three, if you want to share. I was in room three. I'm sorry, my camera is not working. Um, I lost the meeting too. So I'm not sure if they decided if someone else was going to speak or not. We also talked about the motivation and how once they see some growth, how they become so much more motivated. Um, I have a student who made quite a bit of growth this past year and she asked to continue working over the summer. Um, so I'm like, yes, I'm all for that. And we talked about how we've seen a lot of growth in students and another woman in my group also her, one of her students decided to go to summer school this year um, because he was making such growth in the classroom, um, how that can be so motivating. Nice, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else in group number three want to share out? So we're going to move to group number four. We're at 7.49 right now, um, central time. So moving to group number four.
we just talked a lot about how as secondary teachers, you walk in not really knowing that you're going to have a lot of these kids that are that are that can't read and the lack of training in a sense that we had. Um, so when we look at the research out there, we're kind of self-teaching ourselves in the sense that we know better, we have to do better, and it's trying to get other teachers to do better as well. And it's it's kind of like a never-ending thing, and we 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 want to know more yet. It's it's also frustrating at the same time because we know we have to do something different. So we're hoping that we can. Kelly, can you mention the podcast? Agree, just saying, good point. To? About the structured literacy. Yeah, I was listening, uh, Julie Brown. Um, she has a structured literacy podcast out there with Muslim Lori. I actually put the other one in there for Steve Dykstra too. Cause I, like I say, I am a, a a um hold on here a uh podcast freak so i um really want to make sure that i can get everything that i need from those so i have the podcast that we have from her and it's on structured literacy for um secondary and it gives what a structured literacy looks like in a secondary and what she did in her secondary schools to do that. So it's it's phenomenal, I loved it. And I'm hoping that um, you can take a look at that. I'm really, I lost my whole Zoom here. So I, I apologize if I'm looking like I'm not knowing what, what I'm doing at all. That's okay, I, just, um, I only have the last two mes messages from the chat. Um, okay, yeah, I will put that in there. It's because it's, it's a phenomenal podcast from Julie Brown, it looks at the secondary, how, how it should look in the secondary schools and how much time she spends, for example, doing, you know, phonemic awareness and phonics and um, oral reading and everything. And it's, it's well laid out. And um, there's also a online, you can find all those, those, that information, how she did that. So I'll put that um, link in the chat. All right. Thank you for sharing that, Kelly. Um, we're at 7.52, so I'm going to move us right along. So our final thoughts, um, and, I, and I've and uh, i found this quote directly from the chapter at the very end of chapter two, yet through poorly conceived instruction, resistance to scientific evidence and attention to myths and misconceptions, we have traditionally made it much, much harder for these students to succeed. In fact, we have ensured that each year a large proportion fail who did not have to, and that's on page 48. And Kelly, you brought up, if we know better, we do better. So for this, for our final thoughts, I wanted us to think about what you're going to do differently after reading this chapter and maybe you have gotten through the entire book by now maybe you want to hold that at the very end of chapter six when we finish this book study but is there anything that someone will change or start to think of or what would you do next what would you do differently uh, what are some implications for your practice, what you're currently doing? Feel free to share that in the chat or even come off mute, or you can just think about that for a second. So while we are thinking about um, some changes that we are possibly going to make or some things that you are going to continue doing that has worked and shown um, success in your classroom or when you're working with students. I'm going to move on and just share the link for certificate of attendance. So Jeannie, if you can put that back in the chat, if you want to um, complete this Google form, it will, um, you will receive, um, evidence that shows that you attended this session. You have to complete this form today in order for you to receive your certificate tomorrow on Wednesday. So Jeannie just put that in the chat.
And then also follow us on social media. We have a Facebook page. We are the Reading League of Wisconsin. So if you're not already on um, within our um, joining our Facebook on our Facebook page or within our group, please join. Um, follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. On Instagram, our name is let's see. Our name is TRL Wisconsin 2023. And then we are also on Twitter at Reading League Wisconsin. And then also we have our website and I'm going to put all of that in the chat as well. So you all can bookmark our website and find out all of our upcoming events. So our first three upcoming events we have August 3rd, we have another event September 12th, and then um, our annual conference, which is October 27th of this year. I'll put that in the chat as well, and those links are there for you to bookmark. And I think we have, is it next week, we have our chapter three, right? Right, next week is chapter three, and that one is with Rebecca Miles. From Reading League, Michigan. Yes. So thank you everybody for being here tonight. It was great. Yes, thank you everyone. Hopefully you all are able to join us um, next week for chapter three. If not, join us the following week for chapter four. And we're on here every Tuesday, right, Jeannie? Oh no, not every Tuesday. What? When's the next one? Is it next Tuesday? Okay, next Tuesday. All right. Everyone. Um, I think next Tuesday is the 4th of July. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's the week after that. I, I, I just try to get through tomorrow. <laughs> Don't forget to stop and record. Yes. So is, it doesn't meet till two weeks, right? 